is that Mary chose one thing that was needful. Mary hath chosen that good thing. But it's one thing that's needful. And uh, so there is something that's absolutely needful and necessary if we are going to live a happy, victorious Christian life. And uh, you're told in this, in this chapter uh, where Mary and Martha, obviously, uh, have Jesus into their home. And uh, <clears throat> you'll notice that uh, Martha was a, was a busy hostess. Uh, she could make the best uh, of everything. She was uh, uh, very, uh, wanted Jesus, of course, to have the very best. And no one can fault her for that. She didn't do anything bad. She just didn't do the best thing. And uh, sometimes in our Christian life, and we'll say more about that, but if we're not careful, the good things will get in the way of the best things. And that is certainly a danger that every Christian must face. You'll notice that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and she was listening to the words that he had to say. And uh, what a privilege this was. Down in verse 39, uh, you'll notice that uh, she, uh, she sat there and heard his words. And in verse 40, you'll notice that Martha was cumbered about with much serving. One was listening and the other was serving. And uh, Jesus told Martha, he said, you're troubled about with many things. But he said, there's one thing here that's absolutely necessary. And uh, so Mary had chosen that one thing. And uh, I hope tonight that you and I will be able to see what the number one thing is that we need to be concerned about. Now, we certainly ought not to be, we ought not to be unconcerned about serving, but we need to come to the realization that God's first priority is not service. That's not what he's primarily concerned about. I mean, if a man, all he wants is a wife that can clean a house and wash dishes, he might as well get him a chimpanzee. They can do that. But that's not what marriage is about. That's not what relationships are about. I mean, what difference does it make if your house is spotless, and, but, but your wife never has time for you? What difference does it make if your lawn is manicured and you have every of convenience in the world if your husband doesn't have any time for you? And we've been caught up in this materialistic delusion that if our children have everything, they have everything. But nothing is worse than that. You know, you can buy a kid's $1,000 dollar a Nintendo set and, and a little kid or something and, you know, or buy a you know, a, a little infant, you buy them something and they'll play with the box, you know, and forget the toy, you know. We need to get our priorities right when it comes to Christianity. And it's not serving, but it's sitting at His feet. Now, I want you to think about this one thing and what it implies. And uh, what it really means is to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll notice, first of all here, that it, that it implies reception. Look at verse 38. And you'll notice that Martha received Jesus into her house. And Mary had also, verse 39, received him in. But before you and I can sit at the feet of Jesus and be taught by him, we must receive him. And I'm convinced that in most of the Bible-believing churches, that many of the church members have never truly received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I have no doubt about it because I believe when people are saved, they do have an interest in hearing the Word of God. Now, those that interest may vary in different people. I don't think everybody has to have the same appetite as the other person. But if you have no appetite, you're sick. And if you have no appetite for very long, you're dead. And uh, so there must be a reception of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to, to sit at his feet and listen to his words, I think, implies that reception has taken place. Why would you want to hear his word if you haven't received him? Uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense. 
So the very first thing is reception. You'll notice the second thing is that's implied is devotion. You know, the very fact that uh, she was sitting at the Savior's feet indicated that she loved him. I, um, you look at that word worship, the last time it's used in the Old Testament, and if you look up that word worship and check it in Strong's Concordance, it, it has to do with a dog that l crouches or lays at its master's feet. It's connected with a, with a submission that an animal has as it lays at the feet of his master. And so the, the devotion, the devotion here is uh, that she loved him. She wanted to sit at his feet and listen to him teach. We talk about sitting at the feet of our teachers. I grew up at the feet of my grandmother or the feet of, you don't understand what I mean. And so certainly she loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason she loved him is because he loved her. Uh, it's not hard for a woman to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because when she knows him, she knows that he is that pure love. And that he loves her uh, as no other person could love her. And Martha uh, knew that, or Mary knew that. And she loved him because he first loved her. And uh, she loved him for his own sake. She loved him for who he was. It is not hard to love Jesus Christ Amen. if you know him. Amen. Because I believe if you know him, you will love him. Isn't that the way it works? Amen. When we get to know people, we either like them less or we love them more. We seldom say in one place. And you can't get to know Jesus Christ without loving Him. It's impossible. Because when you get to know Him, you know how much He loved you. And you know that He loved you when you were unlovely. You know that He loved you because of who He is. And she loved Him for who He was. She loved Him for what He taught. She loved His teaching because His teaching is right. You know, there's something in man that can weigh things. God has given us discernment and judgment. It's, of course, it's tainted, as the rest of our faculties are. But God has given man the ability to weigh things, just as you have the ability to taste things, or to weigh things when you hear them, or to evaluate things when you see them. God has put this judgment in us. It's imperfect, of course. It's not perfect. But it's perfect enough that you can be judged by it, by God. Because God has made it very clear in the book of Romans that God has put within every man the ability to know good and right and wrong. So you never have to read a verse of Scripture to know right and wrong. Where they accuse each other or excuse each other, therefore they're without excuse. So God has put that in us. And that's why many times, uh, even though we've never had any Bible training or reading in our life, we can hear things and we can just discern this, this is not right. It's a discernment. We may not know what is right, but sometimes we hear things and we say, this, doesn't, this is not right. Something wrong here. So she, she loved the teaching of Jesus Christ. And the thing about the teaching of Jesus Christ, every nation finds that it is right. Did you ever stop to think about all morality is built upon the principles taught in the Word of God? I mean, if you have any culture, any morality in any culture, it will be built on the Word of God. Because these are things that didn't start with the Bible, they started with God, and then they were written down. Because they started with God, they're in God. The law existed before it was ever written on paper or on stone. It was in the heart of God, and God said, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And so uh, it, it implies devotion. It implies submission. She was not standing, but she sat down. In fact, she, sat, she was as, sat down as low as she could get. She sat at his feet, and indicating that she was in submission to him and that she recognized him as the Lord and Savior, or Sovereign. She subjected herself to His authority and His truth. She sat in a place of humility. You stop and think about it. I mean, uh, usually, um, 
uh, people don't sit on the floor unless they don't have any furniture. But she chose to sit on the floor, not to sit by him, or not to sit down in front of him as an equal, but she chose to sit on the floor in submission, as I mentioned. And if you'll look the word up, you'll see it's what I said it was, that uh, it's the same as a dog crouches and lays down in, in, in submission in front of a master. She placed herself utterly under his sway. And I guess that's a question we need to ask ourselves. When was the last time I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ? Now, I, you know, I know in the Bible there's posture for prayer. There's all kinds of posture. I find that people stood and prayed. I find that some people bowed their heads and prayed. I find that some people lifted their eyes to heaven and prayed. Some people lifted their hands to heaven and prayed. And some people laid on the ground and prayed. And some kneel and, and knelt and prayed. So I'm not going to say this is how it has to be. I don't believe that. But I'm a little bit worried about a fellow when he just reclines in his bed and says, oh, I forgot to pray. You know, if you, if you forget to pray, why don't you get out of bed and pray? You know, don't, I still got my head on my pillow. I got, oh, jealous, I got the covers pulled up. And, well, Lord, I forgot to pray. Bless me, my wife and us four, no more. Amen. <laughs> you know, you know what I think? That prayer didn't even get above the sheets. Amen. Don't kid yourself. You wouldn't show that disrespect for any human being. You wouldn't. If somebody came and rang the doorbell, you'd at least get up, wouldn't you? Or would, maybe you wouldn't. Really, I've seen people so rude that when you ring the doorbell, they'll, they won't even get up. I was out calling one time, knocked on a door, I went in. They let me in, and they went in the other room, left me. I'm sitting in the living room by myself. I thought about taking the TV and leaving. <laughs> they were so rude, really. I mean, that was their way. You know, I sat there for a while, and I said, okay, I'll see y'all. Been a joy visiting with you. You say, that happened? That literally happened. One time in my 33 years of ministry. But the people were so rude, they let me in. I mean, you know, I, I don't even get that. And they went in the other room. Did some strange things. I guess my question is, is have you ever, have you ever got on your knees and prayed to the Lord? Have you ever got as low as the floor and prayed? And I don't think there's any, I don't think you're more spiritual because you do that, so you don't need to try to impress anybody. I would suggest you do these things in private. Then you've got nothing to prove to anybody. I mean, I'm not, you know, when we have a men's prayer meeting, I mean, I don't care how you pray as long as you pray. And, and I, don't, I don't need, I don't want anything for me. I don't care. Personally, I would put closet prayer over a thousand public prayers. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Public prayer is, is necessary and it's right. Group prayer is okay. But private prayer is gold. Because Jesus Christ said, when you pray, enter into your closet and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father which seeth in secret will reward you openly. So she, uh, she sub was in submission. She sat at his feet. She humbled herself before him. And I just want to leave this burden with you to, if you haven't done that, why haven't you done that? And if you haven't, will you do it? And you don't need to answer me. But I'm just worried about Christians who are cumbered about with much service, but they don't even have time to bend the knee. There's something wrong, isn't there? She has chosen the best thing, that good thing. Now, why is this one thing absolutely necessary? And I believe it's necessary if we're going to have a well-balanced Christian life. Balance is the most difficult thing in life. It's very difficult to stay focused and stay balanced. Everybody thinks they're balanced. I want to think I am. I strive for a balanced ministry. 
Uh, I'm a dispensationalist, but I think you can get stupid on that. Okay, I'm a King James man. I think you can go to seed on that. I'm a Baptist, believe in eternal security, but I've got other sermons. But it seems like there are certain people that they just find this hobby horse, you know, and they just want to ride it till it dies. I believe in dispensations. I believe in eternal security. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I don't want you to have any doubt about those things. But that's not all I know. We need to know a few other things. We need to have a balance in our life. Did you know the Bible says that, um, that um, it says something? Uh, um, knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. There's nothing wrong with getting knowledge. You ought to get all you can, then you ought to can all you get. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. I wouldn't certainly, you know, I, 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 I'm deficient in that area because I didn't have good discipline as a young person, as a teenager. I didn't have good discipline in my home. Uh, the, you know, education really was not important to my parents at all. And I struggle with it every day. But I know the value of it. And so I certainly would not, I say, get all you can. But you need to have a balanced life. And that is the thing that's hard to do. And so, you know, we, have, we, we need to have this, you know, we just we go, to stream, go to extremes on everything. And I don't think we need to do that. And uh, I inter it's an interesting thing there in the Gospel of John, you know, it, uh, uh, Jesus said in John 10, he talked about his sheep. And notice he said that they will go in and go out. In John chapter 10, I don't know if you want to turn there or not, but it's in 10, 9. But the idea is we need worship, listen carefully, we need worship, but we need service. We need studies and we need soul winning. But we don't need all studies and no soul winning, and we don't need all soul winning and no studies. We don't need all worship and no service, and we don't need all service and no worship. We need to work for a balance in our Christian life. And, uh, and you have to work for that. And the Lord never rebuked Martha for her service. She didn't, he didn't rebuke her because uh, uh, she was serving. But he wanted to show her that sitting at his feet was the necessary requirement for successful service. Because your service will get out of perspective if you're not close to the Lord and you don't worship him. I mean, you'll get bitter, you'll get upset, you'll get demanding, you'll, get, you'll, get, uh, you'll become possessive. It's my service, it's my this, my class, my kids. And pretty soon, you know, and you think you're God and they belong to you. Next thing I know, you died for them, you know. And it's easy to get that way if we don't learn to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's absolutely necessary for growth in grace. Grace is an interesting subject, grace. What is grace? It's a nice sounding word. Sometimes people name their daughters grace. It's a beautiful word, grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace has to do with God's goodness. Grace has to do with God's unmerited favor. Grace has to do with His enabling power. Grace has to do with His sustaining power. Grace. When Paul was being afflicted and he prayed three times for the thorn to be removed, God answered, he didn't remove the thorn. He didn't take away the affliction, whatever it was. But he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Grace. Grace and truth, Paul talks about, when he, and he writes his epistles. He ends them with grace. And uh, he's, 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 uh, it's a salutation at the beginning. Grace from, our Lord Je from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ in almost every epistle except Galatians. 
But that's the way he begins his letters. It's a salutation, grace. He is wishing God's blessing and God's favor on them. And you and I can't possibly grow in grace if we don't set at his feet. But what does it mean to grow in grace? It means to grow in the likeness of Christ and learn the grace of Christ and learn to have grace as we deal with people. The same grace that God has with you. And you can't learn that by serving. You can't learn that teaching a Sunday school class. You cannot learn that preaching. You cannot learn that in your ministry. You have to learn it in your closet. You have to learn it at the feet of Jesus Christ, or you're not going to learn it. Because that's where you get it. You get it from Him. Where do you think you get grace from? You get it from Him as you go to Him. And so she was in the right position, the right place uh, to, uh, for her growth. And as you heard Brother... Um, Green say here the other night, Sunday nights, and I think that was a, match, a marvelous sermon. But Brother Green said, and I concur, that some Christians after 15 and 20 years have not grown one bit in grace. They are no further along after 10 years than they were the day they got saved. There's no grace in their life. They haven't grown. There's no growth. It's just a repeat every Sunday of the same thing for 10, 15 years. But they haven't grown in grace. And the reason you, you haven't done that is you don't spend any time at the feet of Christ. How can we learn of Him if we don't spend time with Him? Take my yoke upon you. Well, when you get yoked up with somebody, you're pretty close to them. I've seen animals yoked together. They basically rub shoulders. And He says, take my yoke and learn of me. For my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. A yoke is easy. And my burden is light. But you can never learn that if you don't get to have time with Jesus Christ. There's no way. And so we have to grow in grace. We have to grow through His Word. You know what she was doing? She was listening to His Word. She was sitting at his feet listening to the words of God. And it is this book, it's the words of this book that change us. It's the words of this book that convict us. It's the words of this book that transform us. See, Jerry Falwell said many years ago, every man and woman under the sound of my voice, he said, will be the same person five years from now with the exception of the books they read and the people they meet. Because people and books shape you. Why do you think the educational system has books, have you in the books all the time? To change your mind. And you pay for that. Well, how can we have our mind, the mind of Christ, unless we have the words of Christ from the book of Christ? It's impossible. You cannot have the mind of Christ without the words of Christ. And so she has chosen the needful thing, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope you will. I hope you will. Not only that, it's absolutely necessary for clear guidance. Most Christians will tell you, I want God's leadership. Most Christians will say, I want God to guide my life. But how in the world can we have God's guidance if we don't even get close enough to Him to hear His voice? Here's an interesting text. Will you turn with me over to the Old Testament, uh, to 1 Kings, way back in the Old Testament. And go to 1 Kings uh, a chapter, let me see what chapter I want, 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. 19, have you got it? 1 Kings chapter 19. You might want to underline this verse. This is a verse to uh, verse 12, 19, 12. 
It says, And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. If you want to back up a little, little bit further, if you'll notice in verse 11, And he said, Go forth now and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. You know what we like? Earthquakes. Sensationalism. Fires. Earth-shaking experiences. But that ain't where it's at. That ain't where it's at. It's okay to have an earthquake once or twice in your life. It's okay <laughs> to see the fire of God occasionally. But that's not where the voice of God is. God is in a still, small voice. And you know how you hear a still, small voice? You have to get close. You know how you hear a still, small voice? You have to be quiet. Isn't that right? You've got to get quiet and get close or you can't hear it. No wonder she had chosen the needful thing because she got as close as she could so she could hear the words of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to do that. Do it. You can't do that on the freeway while you're going down the freeway. And you have to go down the freeway. You can't do that with a cell phone turned on. But I know times you have to have it turned on. You cannot do that with a television blaring. Maybe you have to have it on sometime. You have to get alone. You've got to find a time to get alone. And I'm telling you what, this world will not let you have time. Don't you know when the children of Israel wanted to go three days journey into the wilderness to worship God? Pharaoh began to put the pressure on so they didn't have time to do it. He says, you've got too much time on your hands. If you've got time to go worship God, I bet you could make some more bricks. And people have the idea today that to spend an hour or an hour and a half or something in prayer and in Bible study, they're wasting time. I'm a lot that way. I'm impatient. I don't like to even stop to fill up the gas tank. But I do stop eventually. I hate to stop and take time to change oil, but it's easier than changing engines. You know what I mean? But you can't even have music without a rest. And Jesus told his disciples, come apart and rest a while. And some of you are too busy. You're like the other sister. You're cumbered about with much serving. And if you're too busy to have time alone with Jesus Christ, you're too busy. You're too busy. When I uh, first got into church, I got saved when I was 17, and, but then I got in a little church down in Tuckwell. I was, I was in my 20s, early 20s, and I was so excited. The little church was just getting started, and it's easy to be important in a real small church. One person is a majority, and I loved my pastor. He was a good man. He helped me, and I tried to help him. And you know, the, the, pro the problem many times in any voluntary work, especially like a church, that, you know, the truth is 10% of the people do 90% of the work. And when a pastor finds somebody that's really dedicated and, and will do something, he'll have a tendency to overload them. And because they're excited about the Lord, they'll have a tendency to overload themselves. And so he asked me, would you teach a boy's Sunday school class? I said, gladly. And he said, uh, would you be willing to be our Sunday school superintendent? Well, we had about 40. I said, sure, I'd be glad to be a Sunday school superintendent. I didn't know what I did, but I had a title. So I had a title now. I'm, I'm superintendent and teacher. And then they asked me, would you be willing to run a bus route? I said, no problem. I still got my feet. And the first thing you know, I had about eight responsibilities, and now I couldn't do any of them, right? And now I felt guilty 
because now I couldn't do them right, and I sure didn't want to quit because, you know, Christians don't quit. So what you do is sneak out at night in the dark, you know, to save face. But I realized that I was taking on more responsibilities than I could handle, and I went to him and told him it was no problem. And maybe you've taken on things that are keeping you from praying. I don't think you have, but you may have. And uh, if you have, if you don't have time to pray, you are too busy. You're too busy. You're too busy to please God, I can tell you that. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy to even please God. Because what do you think is more important to God, your service or your fellowship with Him? Well, I know what's more important to Him. You say, what if I told you I pray for you, but I don't have time for you? Okay. I mean, you can understand that. Because, oh, God, I serve you, but I don't have time to talk to you. It, you, know, you know it won't fly, don't you? It's absolutely necessary to overcome self. You know, Martha here, if you notice her, she was irritated, she was distracted, and she complained down in verse 40. And that's what I notice about people who serve too much but don't have a relationship with the Lord. They begin to complain. They complain about their service. They complain nobody helps them. They complain nobody likes them. They complain nobody appreciates them. They com you know what I mean? See? Their service is not a joy. Their service is not a sacrifice. <laughs> They're martyrs. See? And they want everybody to know it. Nobody appreciates me. Okay. Probably not. Absolutely necessary if we're going to get over self. And, uh, and this she did. Self is our greatest enemy. I don't know of an enemy, I don't know of an enemy that I have that causes me more trouble than myself. I don't know of any. I thank God for my enemies. I do. I thank God for my enemies. Thank you, mine enemy. Because your enemies really can't hurt you. They can't hurt you. It's kind of like uh, hearing a noise and running through the cemetery. You'll probably kill yourself. You'll run into a tombstone or something, a gravestone. But, but your enemies can't really hurt you. You say, well, they can kill you. <laughs> okay. Now what? I mean, that's not the worst thing that ever happened to you, is it? Okay. But your enemies can't do that much to you. Your enemies are the one that drive you to your knees. Your enemies are the ones that will cause you to get in the Bible. Your enemies will cause you to get closer to Jesus Christ. Or at least they should. They don't always do that. I mean, but it's not their fault. It's your fault and my fault if we don't respond appropriately. It's how we overcome self because self is always in the way. And one sure way of learning God's method of overcoming self is regularly getting on, our, on the floor, on our face before God at His feet. I don't know of any other way to do it. I mean, you can fake humility, but what we are on the inside comes out. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's why some people are very cautious about talking, because they're guarded. Not spiritual, just guarded. I, uh, several months ago, I don't know why I did this, but I had a quart fruit jar... And um, I guess I've been working in the garden, and uh, I put some things in the cork fruit jar and uh, some little plants, and, and they all died and withered because it's set outside there. And uh, the roots on these uh, plants had dirt on them. And the dirt, uh, I noticed the other day, I was looking out there, and the fruit jar was full of water. And there was about that much dirt in the bottom of it. It settled all to the bottom. And uh, the water was crystal clear until I shook the jar. And then you could see the mud and the dirt. And you know, a lot of Christians are that way, you know. They're, they're crystal clear until you shake them. And then all the mud and the dirt comes to the top. You see? 
Uh, that which looks real clean and pure, many times the dirt has just been just settled to the bottom. And what we have to do is constantly come to the Lord, lest that mud and dirt start accumulating in our life. Because it will do that. And then when somebody or something shakes us, we find out, that things are not the way we thought they were. It's how we overcome self. It's absolutely necessary to gain the Lord's commendation or the Lord's praise. It's necessary. Verse 42, you'll notice that he commended her. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. I tell our preacher boys when I talk to them, and I say it over and over and over. I say it to Jason. I say it to others that God is far more concerned in making the man than he is making the ministry. And a man's relationship is God, with God is not reflected in the size of the ministry. It has nothing to do with it. It's not the size of the Sunday school class or the church or the offering or the buildings or any of that. There are lost people who can build better and bigger churches than we do. So the offerings and the buildings and none of these things are really any proof of spirituality. They're not proof because the Mormons have better buildings than we do. So they're not proof. I don't know of any proof, really, other than our desire to have a relationship with Christ. I don't know of any other proof. It's not the offering. Why? The rich men cast in far more than one poor little widow, but she gave all of her living. But you know what I want to bet you about her? While they were making public prayer, she was making private prayer. Don't you think so? I think if you didn't have but two pennies left, you'd have private prayer too. And I think that sacrifice was only an, a, a, only an outward expression of her real heart and her love for God and her love for Christ. It's absolutely necessary. I do not want to arrive at heaven and find that Jesus Christ is a stranger. I don't want to show up and him to be strange to me. It's one thing to say that I've trusted him as my Savior, which I have. I did that many years ago. But you know, some of you got married many years ago too. And you know what you've been doing the rest of your life is getting to know the person you're married to. And you're finding out about them. And they tell me, as people get older and grow older together, they, say, they take on the same characteristics. And sometimes they even look alike. Now, that's comforting, ladies, for some of you. I look around and see your husbands. But you know what I mean, don't you? And people do. They begin to, they begin to think alike and talk alike, you know. And almost now, any man can start a sentence and his wife can finish it for him, you know. That's a joke. I've got a preacher friend, God bless him. He's a dear friend of mine. But every time he tries to, to, to say something, his wife finishes it for him. I, it never, I mean, it's, you can count on it. If I took him to him right here and let him talk, she'd help him out. I heard about a fellow, his daddy was dying. And he was the only one, he and his mother... And his brothers called him up and said, did daddy have any last words? And he said, no, mom was with him to the end. <laughs> I, um, I want to know the Lord. I hope I know you do, but you can't know him from a distance. Who in that family do you think would get to know Jesus Christ? The one who was in the kitchen cooking or the one who was sitting at his feet? I would say the one at his feet, wouldn't you? It's right. It's right to go to the kitchen and cook. It's right to clean the house. It's right to entertain strangers. It's right to help people who need help. You should not stop that. 
But if that's all you do, you're missing the best thing and the right thing. Get it balanced. You sing in the choir, get a prayer life. You teach Sunday school, by all means, you ought to have a private prayer life. You work with children in the children's ministry, God pity you if you don't pray. Really. I mean, what are you going to talk to people about? See? The most important thing is prayer. And the Lord commended her for that. We shall only get this one thing by determination. You're going to have to be determined. Because the world is going to make sure you don't get it. Your flesh doesn't want it. Your flesh doesn't want you to do that. Your flesh does not want you to get along with Jesus Christ. The world doesn't want you to get along with Jesus Christ. And the devil doesn't want you to get along. You understand? So you're going to have to determine that you're going to do it. I guarantee you there's things that happen in your life and your schedule and your plan for the day that if I called you up and said, I need to, I need to you know, I, let, let's, go to, let's go to lunch today. Let's do this. You would simply say, Pastor, I can't do it now. I'm sorry I can't do it now. Why don't you do that with your prayer life? And all these things bidding for your time and just say, I can't do it now. You don't have to tell people why. It's none of their business. But if you are at the mercy of every stimulus that comes your way, you'll never have time for prayer. You have to determine that it's going to happen, and you have to resolve that it's going to happen, or it's not going to happen. In verse 42, we're told that Mary chose. Notice that. Mary has chosen that good part. She made a choice. If you haven't made a choice to do that, I hope you will tonight. It'd be the best choice you ever made other than getting saved. Listen to what Jesus said. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He didn't say this is life eternal that they accept your son, though it is. That's how you get eternal life. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about experiencing the eternal life. He's talking about living the eternal life, living the life eternal. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God. The interesting thing about eternity is, G is God tabernacles with his people. He's always wanted, God has always wanted fellowship with his creatures. You read in the book of Genesis that he came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's in the evening, the time of the evening oblation, time of the sacrifice, throughout the rest of the Bible. And he came walking in the garden. You know why? Walking implicates, implies fellowship. And Enoch walked with God, and God took him. So he came walking in the garden, because he and Adam had walked together. But all of a sudden, Adam couldn't be found, and he said, where are you, Adam? I wonder if the Lord says that about prayer time in our life. Where are you? I've been waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. He tabernacled. In the Old Testament, he tabernacled with his people. He, 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 he dwelt amongst the Jews in, in Israel. And then the temple, he lived, dwelt there. Then he tabernacled in Christ. And you'll find the same thing in the future. If you read all the way into the book of Revelation, you'll see it's about fellowship with God. He tabernacles. God tabernacles with man, dwells with him. He loves it. It's a matter of deliberate choice. And how determined are you to please him? Verse 41 and 42, And Jesus said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. May God help us to choose that good part. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I pray again that we will not be hearers only, but doers of the Word of God. I pray that what has been said tonight will fall into some good soil, 
and that somebody here tonight will determine I am going to have a time where I get alone with Jesus Christ every day and get on my knees with my Bible and I'm going to pray and fellowship and worship you because it pleases you. I pray, Lord, tonight that we will choose that one good thing and that is hearing your word at your feet. Bless these people, I pray. Help us to, to know you, to grow in grace, to have victory over self, and to glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, let's, uh, you're, you're dismissed. Uh, be sure and shake hands with someone tonight. Let them know you're glad they're here. Pray for the services Sunday, please. You're dismissed.